Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Omida and I'm going to discuss the spinal cord on behalf of Professor Igbigbi. So um, I hope you get to grasp um, something out of this lecture. So this is a picture of the spinal cord, all right? It's um, usually housed within the vertebral canal with, uh, of the vertebral bones. So that's a cervical part of the spinal cord followed by thoracic part, the lumbar, and the sacrococcygeal part. So we begin. Uh, this is the outline. We'll talk about the extent, enlargement, internal structures, blood supply, protection and support, as well as spinal nerves, and finally, the clinical correlates. So that's the spinal cord, the cervical portion, thoracic portion, uh, lumbar, and um, you can appreciate the nerves in yellow. So. Again, the cross section of the spinal cord. So anteriorly, this is how it looks like. And posteriorly, that's the structure. So you need to appreciate there is a fissure. A fissure is like a, a, a narrow um, invagination. And posteriorly, we have a dorsal median sulcus. Okay. Anteriorly is a ventral median fissure. The fissure is wider than a sulcus, as you can see. Then the spinal cord is usually divided into two parts, an inner gray matter and an outer white matter. Remember in the brain, the gray matter was outside forming the cortex, but white matter was inside. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is inside, the white matter is outside. Then you can appreciate the ventral horn, so part of the gray matter, ventral horn anteriorly, which is also called motor horn for motor nerves. Then we have the posterior horn or dorsal horn for, for sensory nerves and we have a lateral horn um, at the thoracolumbar region you'll we'll appreciate a lateral horn. So from the ventral horn we usually have ventral rootlets and these ventral rootlets join to form a ventral root. So these are motor. And from the dorsal horn we have dorsal rootlets that join to form dorsal roots that are sensory. So these dorsal roots have their cell bodies within the dorsal root ganglion. So dorsal roots that are sensory combine with ventral roots that are motor to form a spinal nerve. Again, motor rootlets, motor ventral rootlets, motor roots. Ventral, uh, dorsal sensory rootlets form dorsal roots. So sensory and motor roots join to form a spinal nerve. Okay, then the spinal cord um, usually is covered by the meninges so you have the outer dura mater followed by arachnoid mater then the um, higher mater and the outer portion of the spinal cord we've said it has a white mater and white mater is divided into anterior column lateral column and posterior columns so the extent of the spinal cord it extends from foramen magnum to l1 l2 junction in adults and in infants, the spinal cord goes to the L3 level. Then um, the caudal end of the spinal cord is at the conus medullaris. So the extent of the spinal cord at three months gestation, it's at the coccygeal region. At six months gestation, it's to the second sacral bone. And at birth, the spinal cord goes to L3 level. At puberty, it's at L4. And in adults, the spinal cord ends at L1, L2 junction. So this change in the level of the spinal cord is because the vertebral column usually grows faster than the spinal cord. And the roots of the spinal, uh, lower spinal uh, cord together with the filum terminal, they form what you call the cord equina, to mean uh, it resembles the tail of a horse. So um, that's a picture showing the parts of the, uh, the extents of the spinal cord. Uh, so that is a termination of the spinal cord this is at an eight week embryo at 24 weeks in a newborn and in an adult. So you can appreciate that as the uh, human grows, initially the spinal cord goes to the whole extent of the vertebral column. At 24 weeks, we see it at S1 level. In a newborn, we see the spinal cord, look at the conus medullaris there at L3 level. And in an adult, the spinal cord is up at L1, L2 junction. This other blue is a uh, filum terminal, which is a caudal portion of attachment of the conus medullaris onto the um, coccygeal um, bone. Again, that just shows you 
um, the extent, the lower extent of the uh, spinal cord, it terminates at the corners medullaris, and that's a filum terminal going to the um, coxy, that's a filum terminal to the coccygeal bone. This is the uh, lumbar cistern that's usually filled with subarachnoid fluid. So this is lumbar cistern with CSF in the subarachnoid space. These are the cordae equina. So the nerves that are exiting the lower portion of the spinal cord, since the spinal cord is terminating earlier, these nerves have to exit at their subsequent vertebral level. So they go way lower and eventually form the corda equina, which makes it resemble like the tail of a horse. That's why it's called corda equina. So we have enlargement of the spinal cord. Um, there are two enlargements at the cervical region and the lumbosacral region. At the cervical region, uh, that's at C4 to T1 um, level, sometimes C5 to T1, that forms a brachial plexus that goes to innervate the upper limb. And we also have the lumbosacral enlargements at L2 um, to S3 spinal segments that forms the lumbosacral plexus that innervate the lower limbs. So the cross section of the spinal cord, as I had briefly discussed, we have an anterior median fissure and a posterior median sulcus, and this separate the right and the left halves. Then we say the inner portion of the spinal cord has a gray matter, and remember gray matter in the central nervous system represents a collection of neuronal cell bodies. Then the gray matter is divided into three. We have a posterior horn, which has sensory uh, nerve nuclei, anterior ventral horn that has motor nuclei, and lateral horn, that is usually at uh, T1 to T12 and upper lumbar, L1, L2, and that these usually contain the preganglionic sympathetic fibers. Then the outer portion of the gray matter, we have the white matter, and white matter in the central nervous system contains myelinated neuronal axons, and these are divided into three columns. You have the ventral white uh, column, the dorsal column, and the lateral columns, and these usually contain ascending or sensory um, tracts, as well as descending or motor tracts. So that's the diagram showing the cross section of the spinal cord. As we have seen, the anteriorly we have an anterior median fissure, and posteriorly we have a posterior median sulcus. Then we have the inner portion that has the gray matter, which is divided into a ventral horn, which is motor, dorsal horn, which is sensory, and a lateral horn, which contains sympathetic fibers. That's the central canal where CSF flows. Then the outer portion of the spinal cord is a white matter and is divided into three, an anterior column, a lateral column, and a posterior column. And these carry different tracks, which we shall discuss later. And then, so from the ventral horn, we have ventral rootlets that join to form a ventral root. So these are motor. And from dorsal horn, we have sensory rootlets that join to form sensory roots, whose cell bodies are within the dorsal root ganglia. So the dorsal root and the ventral roots together join to form a spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve is mixed, while the roots are either motor or sensory. So what is the blood supply of the spinal cord? So we have the vertebral artery that mainly supplies the spinal cord, and it gives two posterior spinal arteries that supply posterior third. Remember, posterior third of the spinal cord. And what is found on the posterior third? You have the posterior um, horns or the dorsal horns, which are sensory, as well as the dorsal columns. And then the anterior spinal arteries, there are two, but join together to form one. And this supply the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. And this consists of the anterior ventral horns, as well as the lateral horns, the central gray matter, the basal part of the posterior horn and the anterior and lateral funiculars. So these funiculars are the columns of the white matter. So again, that's a picture to show you the anterior two thirds that's being supplied by the anterior spinal artery. So it will supply the anterior funiculi or column, the lateral funiculi or column, also supplies the ventral horn as well as the lateral horns and the basal part of the posterior horns. So we also have segmental arteries that supply the spinal cord. So in the cervical region, the arteries uh, come from ascending cervical artery, the deep cervical, as well as the inferior thyroid artery. In the thoracic spinal cord, segmental arteries are from posterior intercostal arteries of thoracic aorta, while in the lumbar region, we have the lumbar arteries from abdominal aorta, and the sacral and coccygeal parts of the spinal cord are supplied by sacral arteries from the abdominal aorta. Then we have the largest radicular artery, 
at the level of T12 to L2. It's called the artery of Adam Carries or artery of lumbar enlargement. So it's usually at T12 to L2. So when you're asked about to describe the pattern of blood supply to the spinal cord, so you talk about the anterior spinal supplying anterior two thirds, posterior spinal supplying the posterior third, and the radicular arteries at different levels. So you name at the region of the spinal cord and the sources of its blood supply. So this is a picture to show you um, the radicular artery supplying. That's the spinal cord there. That's the abdominal, the aorta, that's the arc of the aorta, that's the thoracic aorta. So the aorta gives different branches. At the thoracic level, you have posterior intercostals. At the lumbar region, you have the greater radicular artery of Adam Carey's, as well as the lumbar arteries and sacral arteries coming to supply the spinal cord. So this, together with the two posterior spinal arteries and one anterior spinal that are coming from vertebral, all these will supply blood to the spinal cord. Again, that shows you the anterior spinal, posterior spinal will supply posteriorly, and you also have radicular branches subsequently supplying the lower portions of the spinal cord. The spinal veins correspond with the spinal arteries and they will empty into the epidural venous plexus. And um, one large radicular vein, which is vena radicularis magna, will uh, drain the lumbar region. So the epidural venous plexus, which is also called the internal vertebral venous plexus, consists of anterior and posterior longitudinal veins that are interconnected. And these connect the inter uh, at each intervertebral space with the external vertebral plexus. So the epidural plexus is also called the internal vertebral plexus within the vertebral canal, while the external vertebral venous plexus is outside the canal. So they communicate via veins that pass through the intervertebral spaces. So this is a picture that is showing us the radicular, uh, great radicular vein, okay? And then um, these are different radicular veins at the different levels coming to communicate with the external venous plexus. So the internal venous plexus is the epidural plexus and then the external venous plexus is outside the vertebral canal. So the spinal cord uh, is protected and supported by different structures. So the protection is by the bones. We have the vertebral column, as well as the meninges, the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, and the cerebrospinal fluid within the subarachnoid space. While the support of the spinal cord is by spinal nerves, the way as they exit the spinal cord, they offer support and anchorage, as well as its continuation with the brainstem. And we also have laterally the denticulate ligament. So these are the meninges of the spinal cord. We have dura mater, which is the outermost, followed by a flimsy arachnoid mater and pia mater that is bound tightly onto the surface of the spinal cord. The pia mater forms a filam terminal that anchors the spinal cord to the coccyx and also forms the denticulate ligament that attaches the spinal cord to the dura laterally. The spaces of the, the meninges, we have epidural space that is outside the dura, that is where anesthetics are injected. Deep to the dura, we have the subdural space between dura mater and arachnoid mater. And subarachnoid space is found between pia mater and arachnoid mater, and it's usually filled with cerebrospinal fluid, and that's where lumbar puncture is performed. So that cross-section just shows you the layers of the meninges. So we start from outside, you have the dura mater. Deep to the dura, you have subdural space. Outside the dura, you have epidural space filled with fat. So epidural space, then dura mater, subdural space, then arachnoid matter. After arachnoid matter, you have subarachnoid space filled with CSF before you get to pia matter. Pia matter is in close proximity to the spinal cord. Again, that just shows you the denticulate ligament. You can see the way it, laterally it comes from the spinal cord to the, to the dura matter. So that's a denticulate ligament. And you can appreciate pia matter overlying the, the spinal cord. So in the next lecture, we will continue there with the parts, with the organization of the spinal nerves. Thank you very much.